Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Would you like to try out head tracking, but don't want to shell out the money for one of these? But maybe you've got one of these laying around? I'll show you how you can use your webcam to get quality head tracking for the low, low cost of nothing. Coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers. Welcome back everyone. I first want to apologize for my voice again. I don't know what's going on, but I hope you could deal with it through the remainder of the video. Before we hop into the video today, I just want to show you a brief clip of what you can expect in regards to this type of head tracking. While you're watching the video, take notice of just how rock solid the picture is. Alright, so now you know what you can expect. In today's video, I will go over the download and installation process for the application, as well as some tips and tricks on how to get the most stable image quality. I'll go over that towards the end of today's video. If you have any comments or questions today, please post them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you. If you enjoyed today's content, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. All the links for today's video will be down below in the description, so be sure to check that out. Once you click on the link, it will bring you to the GitHub page for the OpenTrack application. Once here, just head over to the Releases section and click on the Latest button. This will bring up the most current release of the application. Go all the way down to the bottom in the Assets section, and here we can select a couple different options. I prefer to install this on my PC, so I will use the Windows Setup.exe download. If you don't want to actually install this on your PC, you can use the portable option as well. But we're not going to be going over that today, we're going to stick with the installation method. Once you have this download, we can then exit or minimize the web page. Now you will open up File Explorer and go to the location of where you've downloaded this application. For me, I've placed it in my download section, so I'll go there, double click, and run the setup process. Once you have the application installed, you should now have the open track icon on your desktop. From this point, you want to make sure that your webcam is already plugged into your PC and it is recognized. So now we can open the open track application, and from here, there's a couple things that we need to set to make sure it's going to integrate with Microsoft Flight Simulator properly. The first thing that we need to do is to come down to the input section and we're going to click on the drop down. Here you want to make sure that you check on the Neural Net Tracker. Once you have that selected, we're going to tick on the little hammer icon that is to the right of it. In this section, we're able to set up all the configuration for your webcam. So at the very top, you want to click on the drop down for camera name and find the camera that you're using. Below that should have a diagonal FOV. Just leave it whatever it is default for your camera. Below that is a resolution. Now this could be tricky because I know everybody's first instinct is going to be to select the highest resolution for your camera. And that's not what we want to do here. The reason for that is it will greatly reduce the frames per second that your PC is able to pick up on the camera itself in the open track application. So we'll leave it set default in the application at 320 by 240. Over on the right hand side, you want to make sure that you tick on the highest frames per second that you have available. Even if your camera is only a 30 frames per second camera, just tick on 60 frames per second. I found that that seems to work best. Below this section, we have a head center offset calibration section. To calibrate your head center offset, you need to have the camera tracking. So we'll go over that in just a few moments. Below that, at the very bottom, we have a couple more options. On the left hand side, we have an option here for thread count. This is how many threads it will use on your CPU. In my personal experience, Leaving this set to the default one gave me some FPS drops. So what I did was increase the thread count to two, and that seemed to give me a more stable FPS in this application. 
We also have a camera setting here to the right. And if you tickle on that, this will bring up all of the actual camera settings for the camera or your webcam. Now this can also be useful to help you get a more rock solid image when you are using the head tracking. I'll go over this in more detail closer to the end of the video. Once you're done here, we can hit the OK button at the very bottom. Now we have configured the input tab. We're now going to move on to the output section. This is where it's going to be outputting the data to Microsoft Flight Simulator. They have now recently added a Microsoft Flight Simulator Sim Connect option. That's what we're going to be using today. Over on the hammer section, we don't need to do anything here, so just leave it as factory and you're all set to go. At the very bottom, this is the filter method in which the head tracking is going to help stabilize and smooth out the image quality on your screen. By default, yours is probably going to say, whatever this first one is, that's what yours is probably going to say on yours. Now with these filter options, you can surely play around with each of these to see what you get the best results with. But for me, I got the most natural head movement from the natural head movement filter option. Now we also have a hammer icon here, and this is where we're able to adjust some of our filter settings. I'll go over that in a little more detail in just a moment. On the right hand side, we also have the ability to choose different profiles. So if you want to set this up for different games or sims, you can do that from here. Below that, we have an options tab. If you click on the options tab, it will bring up all the options for the application. But here's where you can set up some shortcuts. And I would highly recommend to do this to center your head tracking as well as toggle it on and off. All you need to do here is just click the bind button and then press the key on your keyboard. Or if you've got a yoke or something like that, you can use that as well. Below this, I would also recommend to center at startup. And then that's pretty much all we need to do in the shortcut section. Let's move over to the output tab at the very top. In this section is where we can turn on and off our roll, pitch, and yaw, as well as the translation on the X, Y, and Z axis. Below the axis assignment, we have the custom center pose section. Here's where we can adjust the default camera position for the head tracker. Now you're gonna notice that in some aircraft, when you turn on the head tracking, it's gonna put the camera way out front of the nose of the aircraft. So this is the section that you'll use to adjust your default camera position for your head tracking. This particular section could vary with individual aircraft. Heading back to the axis assignment, I did have to invert my pitch axis so you may also have to do that as well. One other thing I did to help with the head tracking stability is I disabled the roll axis. Now that we're finished up with this section, we can move over to the relative translation tab. At the very top of this section, I leave everything disabled. Below this in the neck displacement section, here's where we can adjust how far off our face is from our neck. So you could just take a ruler and measure from your neck out to your face and then put that figure right here. I just estimated mine at 25 centimeters. The next tab over at the top is game detection. You can have this set to automatically start when you start up Microsoft Flight Simulator. I choose to do that manually, so I'm not really gonna go over this section, but you can always add Microsoft Flight Simulator here. Now that we're done with the options, we have one more section, and that's the mapping section. Here's where we're able to map out the amount of input that we give with our own head and the amount of translation that is going to implement inside the simulator. Now I'll go over all of these in just a second. Once we fire up the head tracker, it'll make it a lot easier to show you what I'm talking about. All right, so now that you have everything set up in the application, we need to start tweaking things to get rock solid head tracking. So at this point, you can also start up Microsoft Flight Simulator and get that running as well. For my demonstration today, I'm not going to be opening Microsoft Flight Simulator. I think it might make it a little more confusing. So what I'm going to do is show you all of the methods, and then you can take what I've shown you and implement that for your webcam. Because everybody's webcam is going to be different, so your settings may be a little bit different. All right, so now you have Microsoft Flight Simulator open. Your open track software is open. We can now start the head tracking. All right, there we are. So as you will also see, um, the little octopus over on the right-hand side of the application is gonna move with your head. 
And when you first start this up, you may notice that that octopus looks like that. Just go ahead and hit the center toggle or the center keybind that we bound earlier in today's video. So now let's first go over some of the camera settings so that we can get our offset programmed properly. To do that, we're either going to click on the hammer for the input section, or we can just click on the options tab over on the right hand side. Once we're here, we're going to go up to the tracking tab at the very top. And now we want to start calibration. Now, when we start the calibration, it's telling us here that we don't want to tilt our heads or roll our heads. What we're going to do is hit the start calibration. Once it starts, it's going to tell us how many samples that it has taken. So you're just going to move your head left, right, up and down. Now make sure you don't translate your face forward and backwards. Make sure you're staying in one position and you're not moving around in your chair. Only move your head. When you first do the calibration, do the side to side, up and down, and then see how that works for you. If you notice a little bit of instability, then do the side to side, up and down, and add a roll in there to give a couple more data points. See how that works for you. Again, this is going to vary depending on everyone's webcam and how it's going to track. Also, the lighting in your room. Make sure you have decent lighting. So now that we have finished up with the head center offset, let's move over to the filter tab at the very top. Now keep in mind that the filter tab is going to be a direct correlation of the filter section at the bottom of the open track application. So depending on what filter method you're choosing will depend on what filter options we have in the filter tab. Let me show you what I'm talking about. To change your filter option, you have to stop the application. So we'll do that. I'm gonna go down and pick the first one because this is what yours is probably gonna say. You can see that all of the filtering options are completely different from the natural head movement filter section. If you wanna try this one out first, start out with my settings here and see how that works for you as a starting point. Keep in mind, everybody's webcam's different and your heads are different, so things are going to be a little bit different. I found this filtering method a little bit too jittery and wasn't as natural as I wanted it to be. So now let's move over to the filter section for the natural head movement filtering option. At the very top in the responsiveness section, this is going to be how fast things are moving. So in position, this is going to be a direct correlation to the translation axis. Below that is rotational speed, and that's gonna be when you're tilting your head side to side, turning it side to side, or pitching it up and down. Now, if we take a look at the bottom in the instruction section, it's gonna tell you to set all of your sliders to minimum, and then start adjusting the responsiveness up first until you can remove jitteriness or I don't, it, it was very confusing for me. So let me explain the easy way on how to set this up. In the responsiveness section, I found the positioning portion to be good somewhere anywhere between 10 to 14. I think default, it comes set at 13. So actually that worked out great for me. The rotational speed, on the other hand, can be very different from person to person. And this is where you can induce a little bit of motion sickness if you have this up too high. So what I found is anywhere between five and six gives you a good ratio to your head movement to what you see on the screen. And again, this is all gonna be personal preference, so I'm just giving you a starting point. Below that, in the drift speed section, this is where we're gonna be able to stabilize the image and make it a very rock solid image. Now, here's the issue with that. Just like with anything, too much of a good thing turns into a bad thing. So we have some diminishing returns the higher up you turn your drift speed. So if you're turning this up way high thinking, oh, I'll get a very rock solid image, what actually is going to happen is it's going to put too much latency in the tracking and it's not going to pick up very fine movements when you're moving around. And it's also not going to come back to center properly because it's not going to register that movement because you've dialed in so much smoothness or think of it a dead zone almost. So here's the best practice that I found to get these set properly. To set your rotational speed up anywhere between 8 and 10. That's going to really stabilize 
the rotation axis because we really want to focus in on the translation axis first. So the way we need to adjust this is get inside the cockpit and then you're going to set your positional drift speed to zero. Make sure your rotational drift speed is still set between eight and 10 because we want that rock solid. And now what you're going to do is while you're in the cockpit, lean forward and then take notice of how the camera is probably going to be jittering forward and backwards. Now what you want to do is take your positional slider and start increasing that until you notice that the picture starts to get more stable. Once you get to a point to where your picture stabilizes and stops jittering back and forth, then you can move on to the rotational axis. Again, you can then turn your rotational axis down to zero and you'll adjust the rotational drift speed the same way and then you'll turn your head and hold that position and then you will increase the rotational drift speed until your picture stabilizes. Now, we're not trying to get a perfect rock solid image right now. There's a couple other things that we need to do first. We're just trying to get a good baseline. So now that you've got that set, let's move on to a couple other things. Now, one thing that you're going to notice is while we've been filming here, the exposure on the camera has been going up and going down. That is also going to hurt your image stability. So now what I want to do is go over some of the camera settings that can help improve your image stability. Once again, we're going to go back to the options section, go to the tracking section, and then open up the camera settings. Once you're in the camera settings, there's a couple things in here we can adjust. The first thing what I would recommend to do is to go over to the camera control section and go down to exposure and turn off auto exposure. And then hit apply. This way the exposure is not fluctuating while you're moving around or if the light's changing or something like that. And then it's going to throw off your whole tracking. The second thing is you want to adjust the camera so that you are top heavy in the picture frame. Here I would be about center. Here's the problem if you center yourself and you move forward, it's hard for the camera to pick up your face when you're way down here because you may actually move off camera and not realize it. So by putting your head somewhere near the top of the frame gives you a lot of leniency when you want to look up. Also, it gives you a lot of leniency when you want to look forward because now the camera can really pick up your face. And if it can't see your face, it's not going to give you good tracking. So one way you can adjust that is to either move your camera up and down. Now, every camera is going to be different, but for me, I have an option that I can pan my camera. I also have an option here to tilt, but that doesn't do anything for my camera. So you may have that option, but you may just have to adjust your camera wherever you have it placed. Now, the other thing that can help with image stability is turning off the low light compensation. So untick that and hit apply. So now that we have adjusted the exposure, there is one more setting in here I want to go over before we move on to the video section. And that is the zoom portion at the very top. Now, if your camera is sitting far away from you, say you're watching it from a TV and your camera is sitting on top of your TV and you're, say, four feet away from your camera, it's going to make your head very small in the image. That is going to make it very difficult for the tracking software to track you. So at the very top of the camera control, we have a zoom option here. You need to take advantage of that so that you can zoom in the camera to get your face about as big as mine is on the screen in the application. If you're way back here, the open track application is not going to pick you up properly. We're trying to get the picture quality to be as stable as possible so that our tracking will be as stable as possible. If one's fluctuating, the other one's probably going to be fluctuating too. Oh, I do recommend to keep the focus on auto. So this way, if you do move around, it can focus on you pretty quickly. So now let's move over to the video section or the video tab at the very top. And here there's only one setting that we need to adjust, and that's going to be the white balance. I don't recommend to keep this on auto, and that's because it's going to do what you saw on the screen here, and that's going to make the colors really bright or really dull. So what you want to do is just untick that, and then just set your white balance to a decent white balance, 
Nothing too oversaturated. That looks pretty good to me. We can hit apply and then we're good to go. So that's how to set up all of your camera settings to get the best picture quality. And that will also translate into a more stable image in your head tracking. So now that we're done here, we can just hit OK. Now let's move into the mapping section. See, now that we're head tracking, you can actually see that it is picking up my head movements on the camera. So the first tab we're going to go over is the yaw axis at the very top. Underneath of that, we have a max input. This is going to be the maximum you're going to want to turn your head from left and right. Keep in mind that if the camera loses your face, you lose your tracking. So you're not going to want to turn your head 90 degrees or 60 degrees. Anywhere between 30 and 40 seem to be the best. So you can use my settings in all of these as a base and then kind of tweak things for your liking. The bottom scale here is how far you're actually turning your head. And the side scale is how far the image is turning on your screen inside of the sim. So if I turn my head right or left, you'll see that little dot. I'm only turning my head about 35 degrees, which is going to equate to almost an 80 degree turn in the sim. The other thing that's going to help stabilize your image is if you add a dead zone at the very bottom. So by just clicking on the line, you'll see it adds a new data point. Now, I've already added one, so we're not going to keep that. And what you want to do is you're going to change the data point to where you see 0.5 value. That's going to give you a very slight dead zone to also help stabilize the image. The next tab at the top is the pitch tab. Now this one is going to be a little bit more complicating. So at the very top, we have max input. Again, I only choose a max input of 15 degrees. Anything more than that, it makes it uncomfortable for me to read the screen. Now here's the problem with that. What I've found is by looking up and looking down is going to give me two different reactions, I'll say, with the camera. So looking up seems to be pretty good as a linear scale, but looking down, I seem to need a more of a curved scale. Below here, we can set a asymmetrical mapping, meaning we can set a separate mapping for when we look up and then a separate mapping for when we look down. Again, I went on each of these axes and set a dead zone to 0.5. The very top graph is going to be when I'm looking down. If you look down too far and it loses track of your eyes and face, it is going to lose your tracking. So you don't want to have to look down too far. So this is going to be personal preference, but you can start with the values I have here and see how that works out for you. If you want the down axis to move a little faster, you can move this up to more of a linear scale. But you may find that this will work better by having a more of a gradual. So when you're looking at your gauges, it's very smooth and fluid. But if I need to look at the very floor to set my fuel or something, I don't have to move my head much further. And now I'm looking at the floor. On the roll axis, we have completely disabled the roll axis. So we're not tracking this at all. Doesn't matter what you set here. Now for the X, Y, and Z translation axes. Each of the translation axes, I set a dead zone of two. So under the X axis, my max input is set to 30 centimeters and max output is 75 centimeters. The next axis over is the Y axis. At the very top, I have my max input set to 30, max output set to 75. Now the Y axis is not going to be what you're thinking of in and out this way. In my opinion, that's the Y but that's not what it is here. Y axis in this application is actually moving up and down. Now keep in mind that if you raise up the ratio between how much you move and how much it moves on the screen, then it's gonna to try to pick up any little teeny movements and that can then cause instability in the picture. So if you don't really need that high amount of movement, turn down the ratio on this scale. Now let's move over to the Z axis. Now the Z axis is going to be when we're translating forward and backwards. This again is also a linear scale. I try not to use any curved scales if at all possible. 
And this seems to work pretty well when I need to lean in and look at gauges. If you wanted to make it so that it would lean in faster instead of slower, you could add a data point and then turn that up. And now it's going to lean in very fast. You could also take your linear scale and increase that up as well. If you have any questions on this section, please let me know down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you on that. All right, so that's gonna take care of the mapping section. Now we have another thing that we need to go over and that's in the tracking section of the options and that is the ROI zoom at the very bottom. So let me go over how I've adjusted this for my head and face because this is gonna be different for everyone. Again, you want to make sure that you're in the cockpit and turn your face so you're off center, so you're not looking perfectly center. And then with your head off center, you're going to increase the ROI zoom. You'll notice that the image quality may get a little more stable. Now, every time that you increase this by 0.01, move your head around a little bit so it recaptures you and then stay still and see how that works. Then increase it again, move your head around a little bit stay still until you get to a really rock solid image. I found that going under 1.0 seemed to give me worse stability, but again, this is all going to be dependent upon your webcam, your face, and your head. Now, remember what I was telling you earlier about the frame rate drop if you increase your resolution. The frame rate drop and where you're going to notice that is right here at the bottom of the tracking page. So you'll see that if you increase your resolution to 1920 by 1080, while you're in Microsoft, you're probably only gonna be getting about four frames per second. And that's not enough to get a good stable tracking. So now once you have adjusted all of those other settings, you may wanna come back into the filter section and readjust some of the drift speeds. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is with the key binds inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator, I've done a, a video on the Toby eye tracker, and there's some eye tracking key binds inside of Microsoft. They do not work with this application. You must create your own key binds in the options section in the shortcuts tab so that you can toggle on and off the head tracking. Now, one thing I do like about this head tracking is if you toggle it off, while you're locked in a position, the camera stays in that position, similar to Track IR. Well, that's going to wrap us up for today, folks. Let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section. If you have any questions, post them down there. If you enjoyed today's content, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. To all my flight simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody.